Have we seen a one check? Hey, hi that? guys, it's Doug Polk here. I have been pick. Hi guys, it's Doug Polk here, dude. What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and we're back for another episode of Poker Hands. And today we're going to be taking a look at a hand from Poker Night in America that I was actually in the booth for with Olivier Bousquet between Jeremy Kaufman and Sean Deeb. Let's roll the clip. Hey, Doug, who's the worst player on this table, and why is it Helmuth? <laughs> Well, I don't want to be too mean to anyone, but I don't think Helmuth is the worst player. Yeah, yeah, I think both played pretty well today. Oh, okay. yeah, wow. actually, actually, yeah. I mean, there's a few things I had to do a bit differently, but you know. I hope Alan shot so I could just sweat these two and hope for a big he, one. He he got in there and he totally went for it a few times and yeah. he made some big calls that were this pretty good. That Queen Nine was this nuts. Is the yeah, of Queen Nine was wild. I forgot about that hand. That hand was wild. That turn lead in a river check call <laughs> is just gangster city. That was just that was just gangster city. He just, he just straight thugged it up and doubled through that. I mean, if Richardson had just jammed with the turn, it would not yeah. been as a gangster city. But that's true. the way it played out. That's true. Our hand begins not only with a straddle to hundred dollars. But then a Jeremy Reese rattled a 200 as well. The action folds to Sean Deeb in the cutoff, who decides to make a loose open with 5 2 suited. In general, you want to be folding these types of hands. Also, when there are more blinds like this, you generally have to get through more players, and there's more chance of getting 3 bet, and so it's, a, it's less good to open wide in this, in this structure compared to a traditional 2 blind structure. Anyway, he does decide to go ahead and open his hand, and the action folds to the small blind. Helmuth folds and the action's over to Richardson, the big blind with A6 suited. Now, in this situation, it's kind of a tough spot. You're getting a lot worse odds than you would if you were just the normal big blind and you could obviously call, so calling isn't quite as attractive. Also, there are two players left behind that can act now to squeeze you out of the pot, so that sucks too. I think if you want to play, you should probably come in for a 3-bet. Maybe in some more loose passive lineups, you can go for the flat, and this lineup debatably is one of those lineups, but in general, you should play 3 better fold. Given how loose Deep have been opening in this game, I would have liked to see a 3-bet, but instead, he lays it down. Jeremy now enters the pot from the first straddle with some very disciplined preflop play with 9-5 suited. Over to the big blind, Matt Glantz looks down, has queen-7 suited of hearts. Now, those are going to be, of course, blocked because Richardson folded two hearts, but he calls as well, which is definitely the standard play. Let's take a flop. And we got 10 for Deuce. So Deeb actually takes the lead here with bottom pair. And I think we're likely going to see this check there. But you know what? I've actually seen Sean do a decent amount of merged betting on the flop with a lot of his pairs. The flop comes 10 for Deuce Rainbow, and the action checks to Sean Deeb. Now, with bottom pair in this spot, I don't mind seeing a bet or a check. I think in general, mixing between those two things is good, and sometimes betting can make sense because you deny your opponent's equity. The problem with betting is that when you face someone that's going to check raise you often, it's going to get awkward having bottom pair, and you're generally going to have to fold probably on the flop or maybe the turn. So in aggressive situations, I'd like to see a check, and a nice thing about that too is that when you check back, you have a lot of hands that can call one street or maybe two streets on some runouts. Anyway, Deep decides to go ahead and bet, and now Jeremy decides to get a little adventurous. Uh, which makes me feel like his check range is a little too weak, and uh, check raising against him is going to be a difficult strategy for him to, to deal with. So, um, not, gonna, not really going to be an issue here, because both players... Wait, Jeremy called... Look, man, if you want to play the 9-5 of diamonds on the 10-4 deuce flop, you're going to have to give the flop bet a check raise. Check calling here does not put you in a very good situation. Even if you turn a draw, you're going to have to face a bet and then maybe check raise, because calling is not going to be very good out of position going into the river. And if you do turn pairs, that's okay, but that's not many of the turns. In general, you're going to check to your opponent, and if he decides to fire again, you're toast. So in this spot on the flop, if you want to continue, you should check raise. Calling is a little bit too much. Matt Glantz gets out of the way, which is kind of funny when you think about it, given that he actually does have the slightly better version of Jeremy's hand, although no backdoor straight draw, and we take a turn. Jeremy called and gets the <laughs> nut turn card. <laughs> I mean, all right, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I imagine Deeb's going to check now. The turn comes to Ace of Diamonds, giving Jeremy a gut shot straight draw as well as a flush draw, and Deeb a gut shot. 
Jeremy once again checks over to Deep, and now Sean has to decide if he wants to fire again. There are a couple benefits to betting here. You can get your opponent off of a few pairs that are stronger than your pair, like maybe a few fours or a hand like sevens, but in general, this turn bet would be very inefficient. When your opponent has better hands than you, they continue, and when they don't, they generally fold. Sean decided to check it back, and let's take a river. Does. Oh, wow. Oh, what's up, Jeremy? Back in the booth here. Yeah, so you have, you have... Does it? No. <laughs> so Deeb has trips, and Jeremy pain, painfully has to bluff here because he's got nothing and called the flop. So you got to bluff, obviously. And he does. And, yeah, I mean, I think I'm okay with this. I might, I might go for... So if you're Sean here, how much do you raise to? Like 6,500, 7,500? The river comes an offsuit deuce, and no, we are not in a time warp. Jeremy joins the booth with the hand being played 30 minutes earlier. Now with nine high in the river, Jeremy's gonna have to fire. He can definitely have hands like an ace or maybe five three or a deuce, so he is representing some credible value bets. He decides to bet 1600, which is a healthy sized bet, and I don't mind it. I might wanna see maybe a slightly larger bet than this, something more like two, two and a half K, but this is all right as well. With the river coming in offsuit deuce and Jeremy having nine high, now is the time to bluff. His bet here makes sense because he can have a hand like an ace or a deuce, so you want to bet an amount that those hands could bet. I'd like to see a bet slightly bigger than 1700, something more like 2500 would be good, but he has the right idea of firing out here with one of your worst possible hands. Now the action is over to Deeb, and how much is he going to make it? This is another spot, by the way, that people notoriously under bluff because you have to get creative right. for bluffs, and people are just not creative. How much is that? 8,200. How much is that? How much you got left? Now over to Sean Deeb, and with three of a kind, you're gonna have to put in a raise. Yeah, there's some chance your opponent could have a hand like five three or a better deuce, but because you have a deuce and a five, those hands are a lot less likely. In general, when Jeremy does have a value end here, he has an ace, and he'd been playing pretty sticky facing raises in these situations. When you river trips in most of these spots, you want to raise because there are a lot of hands you can beat that could call your raise. Sean ultimately decides to fire about 8,000, and Jeremy immediately asks him, how much more are you playing? How much is that? 8,200. How much is that? How much you got left? <laughs> 8,200. Jeremy, I don't know what you're about to do, but you're reaching for chips, so I'm getting worried. I'm going to guess this is posturing. So that's I'm going to also guess this is posturing, but if he jams... Do you think this would work? I don't know, Olivier, but we're about to find out. It's a lot. I'm all in. Wow! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! That's amazing. Oh, my God! That is amazing. Oh, my God! Jeremy! Oh, you want to know how much? <laughs> Unbelievable. All right, I'm going to give you some oh shit, Oh, my man. God. Holy shit. He's got a five in his hand. Like, this is... Now, in Sean's shoes, this is a pretty difficult situation. Your opponent is basically saying they have a hand that's a full house or maybe 5-3. Kind of unlikely that, they, that Jeremy would even jam a strong deuce. So he was representing a narrow range. And the thing about Jeremy is, you know he's a man that values a dollar. What's up, guys? Doug Polk, <laughs> betting 42,000 on the money bet with the donkey. All right. So D Doug, gonna... explain to the crowd what, what are we playing? We're doing a $41,000 flip. 42, 000. 40, 42. You have no, four no. outs I'm so dead. right now. I'm so dead. And runners. You got two diamonds. Okay, wait. <laughs> oh, it's uh, negotiating. Six, seven, uh, I will buy out of this for 22,000. 25. <laughs> oh! All right, twenty-five it is. Good. Wow! You, you just made five thousand in got equity. I straight, but that would have. Uh, oh, the oh I, we forgot the backdoor straight. I know. Nothing like when your high stakes flip session turns into a high stakes negotiation. Back over to Sean, though. The way that he should actually approach the situation is like this: figure out how many hands he has that raise for value. Figure out how often he's raising as a bluff. And then of the hands that raise for value, figure out which ones make the best calls. 
Now, the thing about this spot is he should have a couple hands that might want to trap on the turn, like some strong sets to let Jeremy hang the noose on the river. And he might also occasionally have one or two boats, although in general, I think those hands are going to be betting the turn when they have two pair. So really, Sean's main hand he's raising for value on the river is a deuce. The question is, which deuces are the best ones to call? I think in this situation, all of the deuces you could have are pretty similar. You could argue it's better to have a five or a three because you block a straight, but then you also block maybe some straight draws that called and now are going to bluff. So overall, those types of benefits are minimal, if anything. Maybe you could argue to call with your stronger deuces if you feel like Jeremy could possibly do this with a hand like King Deuce, but it's pretty unlikely to put this much money on the line with a hand like that. So all in all, I would say in these spots, if you're worried and you want a quick way to think about it, probably call with your strong deuces and fold with your weak ones. The problem is what deuces should you have in the cutoff? Probably not many. And then it also matters how you're going to play all of your sets. If you're going to barrel every set in the turn and you're going to have a bunch of deuces on the river, well, you only really have one option. Matt said that Sean's hand is the Not same thing as a wheel. Say yes, I have a that wheel. seems I mean, we're gonna find very out. inappropriate to say. 20 minutes, oh, 30 so minutes. Oh, can ask go home yeah, that is inappropriate to say. Now, I did talk to Matt after the hand about this, and apparently him and Dean have a long-running history of needling each other with stuff in these spots and talking like this about the hand. I would still say, in general, just probably not do that. When players are making a big decision, let them make the decision, and then you can needle them afterwards. I mean, regardless of how obvious it is, <laughs> no, that's, I'm sure that would be his response. That everybody knows that already. But still, yeah. that's just not yeah. a thing to say. No, no, you don't say that at the table. But this is a big pot. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! 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 <laughs> the best part about that was that Matt wasn't even in the shot, so you just hear a random hand come and slap him. <laughs> regardless of the outcome of this hand, I have to say, betting the river. And when facing a raise, asking your opponent how much they have left behind, putting them in for effectively a 30k jam, and then telling your opponent to go fuck themselves while giving someone else a high five is really up there on the list of legendary river bluffs. Okay, so I'm going to give like the Doug answer, which is he should consider his entire open range, which I don't think he knows because I think he just picks hands and just raises them. Okay. And then think about his flop bet check turn range. And now he's getting a pretty bad price on his call. So he's probably bet call around 35, 40 percent of his hands. And that means that he's going to have to call. Uh, he folded. That's a good fold. Yeah, it's a good, that's a good fold. You're not even going to show that one? I'm very surprised. Oh, up top. Oh, my. Oh, he got him. He got him. Unbelievable. 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 All right, that's going on poker hands. You earned it. While this bluff worked out from Jeremy, in general, you want to be careful with this move. You're representing a small range of value bets, and you should bluff sometimes, which most players don't. But if you start going too wild, people can just call you with a deuce, and you're going to get owned. Thank you for joining me today for Poker Hands. Make sure to poke that sub button, and I'll see you tomorrow.